Good morning. On behalf of my co-authors, Michael Gusmano and Karen Mashke from the Hastings Center, the three of us would like to thank um, PCORI, thank you, Joe, and Health Affairs, thank you, Alan, for having the wisdom to um, develop this themed issue. We did think it represented wisdom. Patient and public engagement is crucial. But our reflection was that many crucial themes like shared decision making or patient-centered care can seem so self-evident that we policymakers let ourselves off the hook and we don't actually articulate some of the foundational reasons why we've put such great stock in those themes. So part of what our paper does is to do that. It, it addresses what are the fundamental reasons why we should encourage patient and public engagement. And actually my, oh there, okay, there we go. Um, and the first part of the paper addresses uh, gives about six reasons, and I, it goes in, it connects these, some of these very foundational principles in ethics to uh, demonstrate that they undergird the reason why we should be focused on this. But we don't spend a lot of time on that in the paper, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it um, in my remarks right now, because the bulk of our analysis focuses on the reality that patient and public engagement should not be expected to be a panacea. It's not going to inexorably lead to better health care or better health policy, no matter how good we get at it. When you seriously try to achieve public and patient engagement with evidence, inevitably deep value conflicts emerge. Evidence alone is rarely definitive. Reasonable people will disagree about its importance or how, much, how to weight various aspects of the evidence. They find its source, there, there, is, there are differences of opinion about the um, credibility of the source. In other words, there's no escaping that value judgments have to be made about the worth of evidence. So our paper looks at the different kinds of values conflicts that you can expect to emerge uh, when we take this concept seriously. And we look at those conflicts in five different areas, the clinic, healthcare systems, public health policy, the regulatory context, and the payer context. And we use a lot of different examples um, in each of those settings. But they sum up to, across those examples, they really sum up to three kinds of value conflicts. And I'm going to share those three. That's really how I'm going to focus the remaining time I have. Um, and these are not um, perfect domains. They, they're blurry. They overlap. I don't mean to pretend that they're platonic ideals. Uh, they, they have overlap. But one way to think about this is that stakeholders can agree on underlying values, but they may differ in the weight that they assign to them. Um, so an example would arise in, say, countries where there is global budgeting. There might be a question, for example, about how much to invest in rescuing the sickest versus investing in the healthy development of children. So in some ways, this is the easiest kind of dilemma. It's the classic kind of dilemma in bioethics because there are two competing goods. You'd want to rescue the vulnerable and you'd want to invest in children. But when faced with uh, decisions about how to allocate resources, these come into conflict and different people would weight them differently. <laughs> A second type of conflict, and this is very typical of moral tensions in the United States, where we aspire to a patient-centered ethic, which gives a lot of moral weight to personal choice. So given that those are our values, and we emphasize them here, we can guarantee that as we get better at patient engagement, we will also see more conflicts in this, of this type between a patient-centered ethic that maximizes personal choice and an evidence-based ethic that protects community well-being. And I'll give you just two very obvious examples of this. Um, maximizing choice can, in some circumstances, mean reducing population health and community well-being. So here's one example. When parents refuse treatment of proven effectiveness, as in the refusal of vaccines, we ha are pitted between the value of wanting to allow for self-determination, that parents should have a great deal of discretion over the care of their children and um, community well-being. And then the, the converse. There's also 
um, patients demanding ineffe ineffective treatments despite evidence, for example, when people request antibiotics for viral infections. So that's type two. The third type is um, when medicines, the medicines that are most controversial are not the effective or the ineffective, which you see on this slide, but uh, actually much harder are when there are marginally beneficial but very expensive options. And stakeholders have very different views of risk, benefit, and cost. And the paper provides several examples. I'll just mention one is, you know, the concern when when we have very expensive chemotherapeutic drugs that may extend life for five months, but the terminal illness will still be a part of the picture. Um, patients might want that, but health systems and payers might question it, and that is increasingly being questioned. Another example would be the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force mammography guidelines, where um, I probably don't have time to tell the whole story here, but just to say that most people in the room remember that their recommendations were very controversial regarding the need for screening in women 40 to 49. They didn't conclude that mammography screening offered no benefit. It's in this marginal benefit category. Instead, the, guideline, <coughs> the, steer, the task force invoked the fact <coughs> excuse me, that screening in this age group would result in a large number of false positives, and they considered that an important harm. So they put a lot of weight on that. Of course, cost was also there, no. but wasn't, um, it wasn't discussed as overtly as it might have been. So for each of these value conflicts that we described, the paper offers our views about how these conflicts should be managed. Um, and we also offer some cross-cutting recommendations for how to bring patients and the public more directly engaged with the value questions as well as the evidence questions. We offer our views, but we recognize that, that, that others may disagree. We're just trying to provoke conversation. I would say our primary goal was to illustrate the reality that evidence alone cannot help us determine right action. We need patient and public engagement with evidence combined with patient and public opportunities to discuss values and value conflicts that are almost always at play. Thanks.